somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. That's one of the more notable quotes by Carl Sagan, who of course spent a lifetime exploring the universe. Which brings us to the start of this week's show, here at the Coleman Observatory, northwest of Van Buren, with the Arkansas, Oklahoma Astronomical Society. And then we'll take you on a whitewater kayaking adventure along the east fork of the Little Buffalo. And we'll close it all out by exploring Uno Cave, west of Fayetteville, in the Ozark National Forest. So now, let's explore the heavens, here at the Coleman Observatory. I got into astronomy back in the early 1960s when I was teaching school. Basically, I was doing a lot of science teaching. And astronomy just fit in so well because you could cover so many different areas with astronomy. It took in the aspects of math and, and uh, all the other aspects that went with astronomy. And I just got into it more deeply as I was using it in teaching and doing it with students where I would try to get them hooked on more interests in looking at things and wondering what's out there. And uh, of course we didn't have the knowledge we have today about the outer space and of course Sputnik went up back in the early, or, well, early days of my teaching anyway. And uh, I thought, wow, what's going on up here in the sky? They come from all walks of life, but when they all come together, they are astronomers, amateur astronomers. I became interested in astronomy as a young girl, and I think it's mostly in large part due to my mother's interest. When we were going across country when I was a teenager, she took us by the meteor crater, and we went to the Mount Palomar Observatory in uh, California. and. A few years ago, I saw a beginning astronomy class offered in the paper by Bob Moody, and my mother and I took that six-week class together, and then after that, I joined the club. And uh, it's been very beneficial to me. I, I'm proof that you don't have to know a lot about it, you just have to like it. And you can learn as much or as little as you have time to do. When you look at Saturn or a star cluster or a, just a constellation with binoculars, you just get a sense of awe and how small we are. I mean, there's so much there. I mean, you can look all night and never see everything. You can look for a lifetime and never see everything. It's just amazing. When I was two and a half years old, my parents took me outside on a nice clear winter night and we watched the first satellite come over. And I can remember being in mom's arms and dad, my uncle and aunt, and a couple of neighbors and my uncle shouted, there it comes. And I saw Sputnik as it was coming over when I was two and a half. And uh, so that kind of got my interest in the sky. There was something up there and I started wondering more about it. And when I was uh, eight or nine, 10 years old, I noticed that there were more meteors in August every year. And I used to put my sleeping bag down in the garden in between the rows of peas and try to count, I'd try to count to 100 before I'd fall asleep. Sometimes it was hard to do, but I looked forward to every August just so I could count meteors each night. And I always wanted to know more about astronomy, but I didn't know really how to go about it. And other than reading every book you can find on the subject, uh, the best way to find out more about astronomy is to get with an astronomy club. Um, this club we started in January of 1985 and since then we've, we've uh, conservatively uh, estimated that we've been come in contact with at least 75,000 people in the 23 years we've been together. So uh, we've been a I don't know if you'd call it a force, maybe it'd be a farce in the area, but uh, uh, people know we're here now and 
We usually get good response when we have a star party for something special, like an eclipse or something like that. I do all I can to try to help people learn more about astronomy, uh, teaching classes or going to make school presentations, um, everything I can. Kids have got a natural interest in astronomy. They want to know about space and anybody that can talk to them about space, first they think you're an astronaut and then they want to know as much as they can about black holes and meteors and other things like that. They're as curious as they can be and uh, we try to tap into that curiosity and get them interested in science through astronomy so that they'll uh, hopefully do better in math and biology, geology, chemistry, physics, uh, all of those are deeply connected into astronomy. Amateur astronomers also work hand in hand with NASA. There's a lot of work with NASA. Uh, they have a lot of projects that they ask us to do to help them out. Uh, there's a lot of things we could do with this observatory here, um, especially like uh, variable star research and stuff like that, that they don't have the time to do the research, but it's mm -hmm. necessary research that needs to be done. So it's a hobby that you, know, you can actually contribute and, and be a part of science. Sometimes it is something as simple as looking at Saturn for the very first time that will spark someone's interest in astronomy. Saturn's rings, people see those rings for the first time and after they gasp, they say, oh, it's just, it's so beautiful because it's, it's a personal connection. You're, you're seeing those rings, it's not a picture. You're seeing it as it is and it's a, it's a deep, uh, almost spiritual connection when you see Saturn, uh, as well as several other things through a telescope. Uh, it's a fascinating hobby and there's lots to see. That is a very crisp view of Saturn. Yeah. Have a look at that. Those rings, yes. the, uh, the moons that you see around it, Mm -hmm. Titan is that star that looks like a star off to its left of the rings. And real close to the rings, you might see a couple of other tiny, tiny little stars. It's other moons that are in orbit around Saturn. Man, that's something. 750 million miles away. Hmm. The light that you're seeing now took one hour to get here. Hmm. It's roughly an hour old from Saturn. What has made astronomy more appealing recently is the so-called go-to telescope. It will go to where I tell it to. If I input an object such as Messier object number 42, What's push that? a button. M42 is a emission nebula, which means it's a star forming region. Uh, stars are being formed in this nebula from the material of the nebula itself. Mm -hmm. The nebula glows uh, by way of fluorescence. The energy from young stars in the center of the nebula literally energizes it and makes the gases glow just like a fluorescent light bulb in your home. Uh, the gases that are in there, we study them with, with spectroscopes and things to find out uh, all of the chemical makeup of the, of the clouds themselves. They, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, astronomers in the last 12, 15 years or so have started finding uh, very complex uh, chains of molecules, amino acids and things like that, in interstellar clouds. So because they're finding these things commonly in our galaxy, uh, it greatly strengthens the idea that the universe is probably full of life. We are probably not the only ones out there. So you can punch in Mars, punch in yes. Saturn, and it'll go to it. Exactly. 
I'll go ahead and we'll clear that, tell it to go to Mars, and we'll just slew on up to Mars. Travel the universe just by pushing buttons. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, a lot of new telescopes have this capability, and they're, they're really revolutionizing amateur astronomy. However, uh, some people will allow themselves to get real frustrated with it and may put it up. A lot of telescopes wind up in the closet, and uh, that's too bad. That's another thing that we do as a club. We try to help people to understand how to use their telescopes better, even small telescopes. Uh, sometimes we'll have a small telescope workshop at one of our meetings or uh, one of our outings during the year. But uh, these go-to telescopes are, are just great. If you know a few stars by their name, uh, you can use these simple hand pads and find, such as this one has 30, uh, excuse me, 40,000 objects in memory in this hand pad right here. So that'll keep you busy for a few yeah. years. What goes on in the universe also affects us. Just like right now with the uh, solar changes in the in our sun, uh, maybe affecting our our global warming and stuff. Not so much maybe that mankind's doing it, but maybe that the sun is also a variable star and is warming up and is causing some of this global warming where we're, we're occurring. It, it's a natural effect of the Earth. So astronomy covers everything from from chemistry to physics to uh, uh, geology, uh, um, it just it, it, it covers all the bases of sciences. So if we can uh, get to the youth and our kids that are growing up to get interest into science, into space, exploration, things that may save us in the future. You know, if we learn uh, about astronomy and, and all the sciences that uh, it may help us in the future to survive. During the wet time of the year in Arkansas, when the rapids are running, it's time to grab the kayaks and head for the whitewater. And a good place is at EFLB, the east fork of the Little Buffalo, smack dab in the Ozarks. Well, the east fork is a, a, a fairly commonly run now compared to what it used to be, but still uh, quite rarely run, really, overall. Probably about uh, I'd say on a good year, maybe uh, a half a dozen to 10 times, people might get on this river in usually just small groups. Uh, so it's not one of the, the, the most well-known or well-traveled runs in the state. Uh, it's got uh, lots of great rapids, especially starting from right here down. Uh, uh, really class three and four rapids, what we call uh, mostly on the class three side today at higher water, a lot of class four down in here. And uh, this next section is extremely steep. Uh, if you get a, if you take a look down from the top, you can't see anything about where you're going, and uh, that makes it quite challenging compared to a lot of the rivers that uh, that are around here. So we call this a, a steep creek versus uh, versus something like the Mulberry River, uh, and it lives up to its name. Challenge or challenges is the key word in the sport of whitewater kayaking. Yeah, definitely you deal with some things that you wouldn't normally have to deal with and it's, it's kind of like, uh, uh, probably not on, on the 
as much of a large scale, but it's like, you know, you go through a battle or something like that and you come out the other side and the people you were with, you feel much closer to because you've been through so many things and you've learned a little bit more about that person and what they're all about and what they can stand up to. Anyone who's done this for any length of time will tell you that they've had their fair share of close calls. I've had a few myself where you're upside down, you're pushed up against a wall or a rock or something like that, and it does get very stressful very quick. Um, the good thing is we train, every time we go out, we train for those type situations. We practice different scenarios um, where we might have to help each other out. And a lot of times out here, you just have to know how to help yourself because a lot of times, not anything anyone else can do for you. I like to say it's an adventure sport because you can't uh, you can't breathe water yet. So, uh, so yeah, I've 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 had a run in with a rock or two or a tree or two here and there. And uh, this this particular uh, river right here. Not a lot of really serious close calls, but, but some people do end up outside of their kayak and that's not where you want to be on uh, when there's this many rocks in the stream. Uh, hopefully we won't see a whole lot of that today from the crew we've got. Well, you've got a good helmet for it anyway. Huh? I've got a great <laughs> helmet. Uh, I, you know, obviously we, we spend a lot of, uh, of in money and investment into equipment and uh, uh, this helmet, I bought it because it covers everything it could possibly cover. I look a little bit like uh, Darth Vader maybe or something is what they tell me with it. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm not worried about fashion out here. I'm worried about keeping what's inside my head intact. There you and, go. Uh, also, you know, wearing a good PFD. This one's got uh, a rescue belt, lots of, lots of different features on it that you wouldn't normally see from a, from a uh, canoe float down the, the Buffalo River, for instance. Uh, and I'm also wearing a dry suit today, which is a, a heavy investment, but on a, uh, we had an awfully cool day today out here. Uh, we boat at times when it's coming down sleet, rain, and, and uh, really cold weather. And so this is a great investment. Step off at the end of the river, uh, or day of the river, and you're dry. Uh, about $1,000, though, for this particular Gore-Tex dry suit. So. Well, well worth it. Uh, I, I'm, I always say if I get out without it, I'd give $1,000 if I had it. Of course, as in anything else, a certain level of expertise doesn't come overnight, more like years to be able to handle class three and four rapids. Usually, it, it varies from person to person, and it varies certainly on how much time you put into the sport uh, each year. Around here, that's really, re uh, really controlled by how much rain we get a lot of times and uh, how much free time you have if you can jump and go in the middle of the week or not. So uh, I would say though on average people are not ready for this for several years after they start and that's if they're fairly dedicated and, and want to, to do this kind of thing. Uh, it, it also a big factor in that of course is, is getting around people uh, who you can go down the river with, who can show you the ropes and teach you and taking uh, classes. The canoe club for instance in this area offers some great classes uh, I think that really accelerates people forward to go and take a, a, a class in whitewater and then get around the people who paddle this kind of water and hopefully can advise them on what they should and shouldn't, shouldn't do. The best thing I like about it is the worries of everyday life, you don't even, you're so focused on what you're doing at hand that you don't, you don't even think about, you know, just the stresses of everyday life. That's, I mean, it's, you just, and the rush that comes along with it, like you I mean, it's, it's just unexplainable.
Uno Cave west of Fayetteville, as far as caves goes, really isn't all that big. It's about 600 or so feet in there. But what you'll find in there is rather interesting. The eastern pipistrelle bat, cave salamanders, and a stream. Leading us in will be Rhea Riley, who's a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service. They call her the Bat Lady. After you. <laughs> Uno Cave is located in the Lake Weddington Wildlife Management Area, about 10 miles or so west of Fayetteville on Highway 16. Well, right now, uh, you're looking at the Eastern Pipistrelle. It's one of the most common bats, common cave bats. You'll find them generally year-round, and they're one of the smallest bats in Arkansas. And over here, in this wet area, we've got one of probably about five different species that like caves or cave entrances. It's a cave salamander. They're fairly common in the caves. They like really wet areas. But basically, this cave is about 675 feet long. Um, it was found in 1988 by the AACS, the Association for Arkansas Cave Studies. Uh, they found it, and then it was mapped in 2004 by three individuals and um, we were actually out doing inventories of this area and we had noticed a lot of trash around the cave entrance and when we came in to take a look at it we found a lot of graffiti a lot of trash uh, the remnants of a methamphetamine lab and so we decided that we probably needed to go ahead and shut this cave down for a little while to clean it up and give it a rest As of June 2008, Uno Cave has been reopened on a permit basis, available at the Boston Mountain Ranger District office in Ozark. Permits are offered only during June, July, and August. Rhea Riley shared with us how she eventually became Batwoman for the U.S. Forest Service. Well, just starting out as a stay in school student uh, with the Forest Service, I had the opportunities to go with different biologists in the caves, and then I really started doing a little more caving when I was working on the Sillimore Ranger District, because that, that district has more caves probably than any other district on our forest. And I worked with the AACS and some of the grottos, and they started kind of teaching me a little bit of caving. And I'm, I'm a fairly novice caver, but I really enjoy it. I like, I like doing this. This is, uh, this is one of the funnest parts of my job. Totally different world down yeah, here. Yes, it is. Really neat, really interesting. I see a salamander over there in the corner. Yep. There's, there's several of them. Yeah. Last time I was in here, there was probably, I think we counted 18 cave salamanders, and they like the real wet areas. And like you said, this has a perennial stream in it, which is kind of unusual. And another reason why we did close this cave for a while is we did find a new species of a cave silverfish, and they still haven't identified it yet. So we just thought it needed a rest for a while, and we got it cleaned up. And now that we've got it cleaned up, we're hoping that we can let the public back in here if they'll take care of it. Well, that was a lot of fun. I just kind of felt like I just crawled through a sewer. <laughs> now I know how a sewer rat feels like. <laughs> Whose idea was this anyway, Michelle? It was yours, oh. too. <laughs> okay. All kidding aside, we did have fun wild caving with Rhea Riley, the Bat Lady. So if you'd like to explore for yourself the 2,000-something wild caves that are in the Ozarks, 
a good way to go about and do that is to get in touch with the local grotto club. And if you'd like to take that whitewater kayaking challenge, the Arkansas Canoe Club is the way to go. They have many chapters throughout the state. And don't forget to explore the heavens, either with the Arkansas Oklahoma Astronomical Society or with a local astronomy club. And for more on these destinations and their websites, or to order a copy of an episode, visit our website, aetn.org slash exploring Arkansas. And we'll see you again the next time for another exciting adventure on Exploring Arkansas.